Welcome to Philly Tokyo Presents Side Project Spotlight, episode 39. This is a developer's journey into making cool stuff. I'm Kotaro. I'm Steve. And I'm Aaron. And we are Philly Coco, a Philadelphia-based Cocoa Heads community focused on Apple development. That primarily, but not exclusively, means iOS, Mac, TVOS, and watchOS development. Philly Coco's true desire is to take you higher on your own developer journey. Uh, whew, all right. Got a little bit, got a little bit uh, shaky at the end, but hopefully I recovered. <laughs> <laughs> I think you did. I think, I think, I think it worked out. All right, all right. Nobody's gonna pay attention, so it'll be fine. <laughs> this week we got we got some interesting stuff. This week we got we got an update about the mobile union coming up. We got a whole a whole speculative section about the new Apple glasses, whatever the heck they're gonna be called. But before we get to that. Pickle jar update. Yes. So for anybody who's just started watch listening to this podcast, Pickle Jar is a side project that we have been working on for a while now. Um very, very slowly. Very, very slowly. <laughs> it's a habit forming habit tracking app. Yeah, that's that, what it's evolved into, yeah. Yeah. It started out as a which which um by the way, I've noticed a whole <laughs> bunch of these coming out on the market now. So it's like we started it and then there was like there was like one that I found. I remember having trouble finding stuff. We've taken so long that it's like the market has lapped us and they've they've caught up to us. <laughs> Where we so, were. So, so by the time it's done, so, everybody would have come to the conclusion it's a horrible business idea, it's, it's, and, I mean, and the apps would die, and then we will have our our app will be a I, success. I I, I, by, I mean, I've seen, I've seen some that are pretty similar, and but I don't think anything is exactly the idea that we we've, we've been doing. So um, yeah, there's some really good ones out there. But we're um, we're, we're so screwed. They're really good. <laughs> some of them. I forgot his name. Jart Jart Jart. Uh, forgot his last name, but. His his one was pretty nice. Uh, um, yeah, I gotta I gotta I gotta do some more um, uh, market research to catch up. <laughs> like, you know, you know, uh, Charles Perry would always uh, who is a part of um, he was originally part of Release Notes podcast. I missed and, that podcast. Yeah, that was a great podcast. Release Notes was a podcast um, that talked a lot about the business side of indie development. And Charles Perry and Joe Chaplinsky, who were the the, the hosts for that show. Um, Joe Japlinski is a consultant, um, mobile consultant, if I remember correctly. And Charles was an iOS developer that uh, migrated to being a, a SaaS developer. Um, and he has built a great app, a great service around uh, supporting accountants. Yeah. Um, so he had always said that you should do, before you start your project or whatever that you're serious about, um, you should do some market research and figure out who's in, you know, how, you know, how crowded is your space and whether you have any, <laughs> any niche that you yeah. can like fit into if, if you can find one. Yeah, this is, this is, uh, this is good advice um, that we ignored. Yes. Well, um, I mean, we intentionally ignored it because we're not, we're not, we weren't, I mean, yeah, we all, it would be nice if it was like a business. We weren't actually going into this thinking it was going to be a business. So like, yeah, like if, if, if for some reason we eventually get this done, and and like all of a sudden it blows up. We get like a hundred thousand downloads. I mean, first of all, I think there's something wrong with the app store. Something broken. But <laughs> if it turned out that after investigation it was true, then I'd be like, okay, maybe we stumbled on something good. That's great. But the 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 point of it is just as he said at the beginning was more of a side project, more to learn some stuff. Especially for me, I feel like I'm 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 catching up, but I'm still not a hundred percent caught up on the. Uh, or on like Swift UI and Cordae and all that stuff. So mm-hmm. it was a good way of of helping me, um, you know, catch up on that stuff and give us something to talk about. I mean, the other thing is that there, are, you know, a lot of these apps that we've built, you know, you can argue that they're portfolio apps. And yeah, there's gonna um, be a portfolio app if, if we finish and, it, and then people can listen to the podcast. I'm like, how come it took you so long to finish this? Like, well, you know, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Life, the life, this yeah. Is like, yeah. This is see this is... <laughs> in the stories about how software is developed. You hear the abbreviated one where they they, they skip over the long periods of time where you know there, where you need to start over again, or there was like you know something else took up your time. I mean, it, this happens all the time at, at, in your day job too, where it's like you're working on something, and then you just have to stop for like weeks at a time. Sometimes and you have to come back to it. It's, I mean, it's, it, this is a realistic look at part-time app development. Although I will say it's kind of funny because, like, now that you mentioned it, 
our first Psy project that we ever released during this podcast, which was called Kanji Love. It's a watch OS app uh, about, you know, basically a flashcard uh, for Kanji, Japanese. Yeah. Um, uh, still in the app store. You can get it, guys. Still in the app store. So good. I still play with it all the time. Yep. Um, thanks, Aaron. Uh, and so we had built the whole thing um, and then Swift UI. At, but, and then, you know, and during the course of, I don't know how many episodes, maybe 10 to 12 episodes, we finally released it or something. Um, and, and, and you had already been working on this idea in some capacity for like years before. Years. Year, <laughs> so, like literal so years. Like, I, at you some know, point, I don't feel too bad. Like but, me and Aaron, me and Aaron had worked on it like for like in a variety of different ways. Like in in UI Kit, we made iOS apps around that same yeah. mechanic. I mean, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, there was like so, two major versions. There was a UI Kit one that got close, and then there was we redid it in Swift UI for yeah. for iPhone when in like maybe Swift UI two days. Yeah, yeah, but that yeah. never got finished either, and we finally finished it. Yeah, as the standalone watch version. So at least with this one, we have we actually have a like a nice looking UI now that Kotro provided. Actually, looks really it looks it's and this we I think we might have talked about this last time, but like it looks so much better. I don't know what like it it's um it's weird. I booted it up like after your your PR with your UI changes, and I'm like it looks like a whole different app. It looks like it has a coherent concept behind the design it's like this uh what are you calling it what do you call it the um your like design aesthetic you're going with it's it's kind of like bringing back a little bit of of skeuomorphism but not but only a tad it's like a, like a sprinkling of it in there i think it, it tries to bring back the spirit of skeuomorphism yeah. um in the sense that how you relate to the to the app um you know there in skeuomorphism this is prior to ios 7 there was a lot of textures, fake faux textures, you know, linen, um, wood panels, you know, everything was, every bit of the Chrome was like some metaphor for the physical world because we were trying to educate, Apple was trying to educate people, like you can touch it, these are tactile, these are relatable. Um, and so like we went too far to that spectrum and most of it was like cheap parlor tricks in the sense of like maybe you have some animations here and there and um and they were like animated gifs or something of that nature where um a lot of it was non interactive uh as much mm -hmm. as you could have done. Um you mean the skeuomorphic design? Yeah. In the I mean we had the days. green felt though. I mean yeah. Yeah, that, made, that made it worth it. <laughs> green exactly. felt. Or like the page turn, right? The page turn. For oh my the, god, the page turn. I know we're going on a right, tangent because that's what we do here, but so many people were upset that the page turn animation was removed from mm -hmm. the what the iBooks app or whatever yep. they call it, books, books app now. Yeah. That they brought it back in a yeah. later beta. Yeah, <laughs> like because... recently, like the latest the latest releases. That's funny to me because uh, that's a cool animation, but it's not particularly useful. It gets old fast when you're actually reading. At least sure. it did for me. But... I mean, it's just one of those like tactile ish feeling. Of, yeah, but like... it's cool. It's really cool. Like it does, it, it, especially if you're on an iPad. It feels yeah. more like you know you're like moving. I remember that that animation was so hard to get to work in the early days. It was, and and it was like <laughs> processor intensive. I don't, people, yeah. I remember people would write write articles about how did Apple do this. So. And but if I look at like Swift UI, I feel like a lot of these sort of like as, like things that we the skeuomorphism sort of aspired to be, you can do now. With yeah, yeah. relative ease. Um, and so now what you're seeing or what we will be seeing within a year or two are very outlandish, bizarro animations, yeah. um, like a uh, combination of graphic effects, that kind of stuff. Yeah, but what you what you did is uh, far Just, more restrained. Yeah, so yeah, we, yeah, 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 yeah. So we I, have this we have this nice it like it looks it, it, it looks like a, it looks nice. We'll have, to, we'll have to get actual screenshot or something out there soon. But it looks nice. And then. Um, we were we were talking about goals and sprints, and I think we kind of figured out uh, what we're going to do off, be off of off of this uh, recording. Right. What we need to do with to do with our how to do with our model. We just need to write some uh, some um, helper methods, essentially. Mm -hmm. To yeah. so the the problem I think we kind of briefly described the last time with the counter problem was when you're doing an app like this, you have these goals, and we want to put them in sprints like you would like software development wise, um, and yet we want to have a history of everything. So it's like, how do you do the data model? Mm -hmm. so that 
and and my my suggestion was that everything is uh, is basically uh, date stamped in here. You log stuff with a date. Sprints have to have a start and end date. You know, at least implicitly. Like if you say I want to sprint starting from today for fourteen days, like you can figure out what the dates are. So at least it's, it'll be in the data model. Mm-hmm. And uh, goals obviously don't have a date, but goals have sprints, and sprints have goals, and it's probably more like a many to many kind of thing. Uh, and then uh, you just figure out what your current sprint is by looking at the date. Mm-hmm. And then you look at historical stuff, again, by going back in time on date. So I think that'll work for the screens we had. But we just need to, uh, uh, and I've done this before in like lots of other, other, in lots of languages where you like, give me a date and figure out where I am in between these things. There's a lot, it's not that, not that hard. I think um, the latest date APIs from Apple make this a lot easier than it used to be. I remember writing like custom helpers in Objective-C so long ago to do to just like package up all the brackets mm-hmm. that were necessary to make the work because in objective c it was just basically a sea of brackets to make stuff work so uh, i think that'll work for us and then um we can finish up the uh the main screen. i think we only have really the main the main swipey screen yeah There's is still... pretty good it, it, it needs a little bit of work i think on the uh, i noticed like on the the like check mark kind of animation, like yeah, it, yeah. The, sl- the sliding works, but the indicator that you've 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 said I didn't do it or I did do it is it didn't quite work for me. Yeah, right? yeah, it, it it's a little too um, it doesn't it like last minutey like it'll yeah, show yeah, up yeah. but it's it'll just, like and it won't but, show up correct. It needs to be a little more blatant. So that yeah, it needs to be a little works. more blatant. But it, but the animation works. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, we have basic screens for creating everything, mm-hmm. you know, sure. and uh, and so I mean, we could we, we're gonna. We should probably have a little discussion off off of this about uh, like reevaluating where the UI is for mm-hmm. this, but uh, it's coming along. It's pretty good. It's pretty cool. good. So there's not a whole lot left. To, I mean, we could probably dog food it right now. I think we have most everything working mm-hmm. in a very basic way. So we, we, I think I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna boot it up. I'm gonna put it on my phone and see if I can use it <laughs> okay. this week some more because I I used it a little bit early on and then um, we broke it for a while. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and but your PR, I think uh, everything was was basically working. Cool. So that's cool. So that's where we basically are with that. We have a we have a mm-hmm. spiffy UI across most of it. The main interaction is working pretty well. The main interaction for the iPhone version, which is what we're, we're working on, which is um, you basically checking off your goals for a day. Not uh, right. I mean, obviously going to add, add them in there, but the interface for doing that is not is is pretty basic. Mm-hmm. Um, and we'll have a uh, we'll have some very basic the basic looking at the logs and and stats, but that stuff is going to be secondary, I think, to the primary use case for this case for here. Yeah. And then if we want to expand on that. We the plan was originally to do like a Mac or iPad or something. We'll see. Yeah, yeah we'll see. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and so hopefully, uh, you know, and we we completely blew past our um, deadlines for things. So we're not going to give deadlines anymore. Not for now. Uh, you know, so uh, when it when it when it's available, we, we'll put a link so, when we have so. a test flight build ready. Which we, we tried the deadline something. approach, did not it work. work. It, you know why? And it and it just proves it never works. We should know better. <laughs> Professional software engineers, we yeah, encounter this all the time. Work. I argue this all the time with people. I'm like, they ask me, well, how long is it going to take? I'm like, I can't tell you. Well, like, you just give me a buck. Like, I can't. Like, I'm like, by what methodology look, look, would you not, like me to we're use not, we're not, we're to not, estimate we're, something we're that I've not, not done? Not. You know, we're not, like, we're not using that that uh, <laughs> password is swordfish or whatever that movie was, the Hugh Jackman movie. Yeah, like, you know, I suppose, we have a gun what? to our head to like. Yeah, yeah. We only have two I, minutes to crack a passcode. We don't I have mean, those type of deadlines. Th- this this is like a we could do a whole episode about how estimation estimations like, you, like I'm like all the time I'm like throwing up my hands like I can't I'm like I I'm like I'm being honest with you like I can give you a number but it will be bullshit like I can't. How am I? I'm like literally. Just tell me if you can tell me how to reliably estimate how long it will take to do something which I have not done yet. You will like win awards, okay? You will become a multimillionaire because you will have found the methodology that to make software estimations work. Like it's like it just it doesn't work. It's very hard, especially without outside of like a coherent like repeatable process you have practice in, which is not the case most places. So if, I, if you're just telling me out of the blue, like, here's here, we want to do this. How long is it going to take? I, I have no idea. Like, like you know, like, you, you want know, me to spend, like, a week trying to figure it out? Or you want me to you, do it? You, you know, you just gave me an idea. I should yeah. just take a, um, a requirement spec and run it through J- chat GPT and then yeah. ask chat GPT. So given a level of maybe, like, maybe I have, like, um, 
one senior developer, one junior developer, and like an intern working on this. What do you estimate <laughs> the time to completion of this of this particular requirement spec? <laughs> well, <laughs> I would love Chat to see TV, its answer. Is ChatGB going to take into account like the ancient hardware? I might have to use for some part of the system. You have to make sure you have to make you have to make sure you give the context. Yeah, all the context. I mean, yeah, all the context. And then <laughs> and then here you go. And so now you spent all this time trying to estimate something you could have just been building. And this is why agile development doesn't do a lot of like the upfront estimates like that. There a lot of it focuses on like let's let's get things moving and let's mm -hmm. like sure. let's retroactively look at what our our actual progress was and use that as our guess for the future and then adjust things constantly in this feedback loops. And even there, the estimates are never accurate. Like they just kind of, you're just hoping that you kind of move gradually towards useful, useful guesses about how long it's going to take to do stuff. I and mean, and the more and the more original the kind of work is you're doing, the more difficult and possible it is to estimate. Can, can I ask a question about uh, estimate um, agile in general when we can, talk you could about... ask I, I don't know if we can answer it but all right um, give us a shot. when we talk about when they talk when you do estimates in agile right or at least tr traditionally yeah. um, you're using um complexity as the as the point system as the as the yeah. measurement of how long something will take right it's not time based it's all based on like yeah. this you know a banner change might be one point right but that's one point because of complexity it doesn't describe time Mm -hmm. yeah and, and it's supposed and to like take into account everything like like you're like okay well i know that this is not only not complex but it's not going to be hard to implement because presumably you understand maybe what your build chain is too mm -hmm. and like you could be in a, in a if you're in a place where making a banner change requires you to go through like 15 other people and they have their own schedule and you like I, this happens like what you want to do a website yeah, update yeah. maybe you can only do a website update once a week so now do you take that into account in your estimate of how hard it is probably to some degree because you you want to be like okay you want to change this but you know it's going to take like it's going to take like a week in the back of your mind you know it's going to take at least a week just because of that and so maybe you factor that in anyway i'm just getting off off top a little bit but you, you, the, the point is it's like a simple <laughs> little point <laughs> yeah it's just simple as you said it's like this uh it's it's like a number I, or a t-shirt size or something that's trying to encapsulate a whole I bunch mean, of concepts so i get that right like i, I can appreciate yeah. that but it, it's such an it's such a pseudoscience in yeah. the sense of like I mean, I, I have better luck with astrology than I would have with like, <laughs> yeah, with like making sure that this would actually, this would actually realistically be the the proper estimate, right? And these yeah. are, and again, these are estimates. So like, when when you know every sprint, it, it always comes to balance. Like, okay, we didn't reach these. Um, you know, you would think that they would reach to a certain conclusion and go, okay, maybe something's weird about how we are aggregating these estimates right because they're they're not right. they're not there's nothing objective about these estimates that's all based no. on opinion and then if you give an estimate of time then people assume that that's like what's going to happen like, right. like but they, they always the they future. always go they always go back to time that's the thing like the yeah. lizard brain will just kick in and be like okay well this point means one day or this well, point I mean, means the, like less than a day right there like, are deadlines for things i understand that but uh sure. you know it's uh that's why the i think the um the uh, approach that if you can get it to work mm -hmm. is probably like the quote unquote best approach is a continuous delivery of value. Sure. Like if you, and I think this really works if you're building something from scratch, not if you're necessarily doing updates and stuff as much. Yeah. But if you're, if you're building something from scratch and then someone is coming to you and say, I have this problem and you're trying to like figure out what the requirements are. And you, start, you start trying to build something that gives value that starts kind of answering the question, starts giving the feedback. And like during this process of building something and then having the, the you know the product owner whatever you want to call it use the mm -hmm. thing, uh, then eventually you could get to a point where you solve the problem good and good enough mm -hmm. for the end the end user and then you can just stop and you don't necessarily have to implement every idea you had up front like that and then that way you're not really estimating things because the whole time you're providing something valuable so mm -hmm. if you're if you imagine like that's why it works best when we start from zero because if I, if I have nothing and you give me anything at all that even remotely helps me solve this problem, that's a net benefit. And we just keep doing that. And the whole time I'm getting, as a user, getting more and more benefit from it. And then eventually I'm like, this is good enough. I don't want to pay for it anymore. This is fine. Mm -hmm. And then you're done. And then you're done at that point. 
instead, there's still this obsession in so many places with like, we have to define this and we have to build it up to this definition we came up with, you know, six months prior. And if we don't, then it's not done. And it's like, but maybe you don't need all that stuff. So, but I, I understand it's much you more complicated. It. You yeah. don't need it now. You don't need right. it. Now. Well, yeah, you don't need it. Well, when you need it, then you can, yeah. when we can yeah. build it. Yeah, exactly. uh, And then like, it comes down to it's, software it's, architecture and craftsmanship and whether you built it to be updatable. Yeah, and software is never done, right? So, no, it's never done. But at a certain point, you got to stop working on it. So, sure. you know, uh, I like that approach of that continuous, it's like, you know, different different uh, names for this kind of concept, like, like continuous delivery or continuous integration. I don't know. Sure. Like, the, or these, these are techniques in there. But the continuous delivery of value is what I, I always thought of it as. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm not saying it's easy to do. I'm not saying it even works in all scenarios. But that is like the, in my mind, kind of the ideal where you're just, Every you're just constantly releasing something that's useful, mm-hmm. and then eventually the customer or the client just like that's enough, and then you move on. Uh, you know that's like the the ideal world, I think. Right. Uh, whereas in the real world, you know we just we just keep I, plugging I, away at things. <laughs> I, I will say I will have to put out a a little bit of a mea copa about uh, one planning software that I give a lot of crap to. Um, Jira. Um, I, I, I've trashed it for its slowness for a long time. And fairly recently, I, I went back to it going, okay, let's, you know, maybe things have changed and they have, at least for the most part. Um, maybe I was on a down period or something, but like the drop downs do not take, the models do not take five seconds to load the down. No. They, they're relatively fast. Now the drop downs actually are performant. Um, so having said all that, (laughs) um, my, my consistent complaint about it is the workflow feels very, um, I don't know, very slow in that context, but, um, I do, I do want to at least extend, um, a, a, a olive branch in that sense of like, yes, it's whatever my complaint about its speed is gone for now um yeah i I think i mentioned this because i just started using jira i was like i didn't notice any slowdown Mm -hmm. but i mean it has some strange architectural decisions i think i mentioned that before it was like the uh the the weird way you can't you can't just change like an issue type like why do i have to go through some batch update process like to to why can't i just select a new type it's like there's certain fields that you have to go jump to a lot of hoops to change Mm -hmm. and i'm like and it's it's baffling to me that that's why the way it is. And that's really aggravating <clears throat> because, sure. you know, if you, if you have something as a user story, but it's like, actually, I want to change it to a type, some other type called like a task or something. It's like, well, okay, you could do that, but you got to like jump through a multi-screen interface that like does something in the back end. It's very terrifying looking, <laughs> you know, you the screen. It's like, we're going to edit all these, these, these things for you and hope it works. And you're, you're like, okay. And then, then you have to wait for the screens to kind of refresh themselves. Like they don't always, give you the up-to-date data and you're like refreshing the browser like did it work i don't know i did this on one of them on something and i was and it just took forever i, I was um changing the name of tags or something like i or labels labels right and uh and it was just a test run i was just testing these 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 interfaces and i changed the tag name and like some of the interfaces it just didn't change it like it was still there like there was some local cache so yeah. it was uh it was uh it, it was an experience so not a, it's faster but still has its own problems um yes Yes. So uh uh maybe maybe uh, our uh our neck maybe the Jira is the new speedy Jira is what is helping <laughs> our I'm trying to find a segue here, so I'm like grasping but it's not well, working. Well for let's our, let's for let's our, let's are not a sponsor let's, segment. Let's let's not let's not worry about the segment. I mean worry about the I'm sorry, <laughs> the transition. Let's we don't need to be about, professional at all about it. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Not at all. But I, I just wanted to do something. I want to bring back something um, that we haven't done in a while, which yeah. is a non-sponsor sponsor. The not a sponsor Con- segment. Not a sponsor segment. I think it's what segment. we call it. Yes. And this is to our good friend, Arpit uh, Mather, who uh, created this great app called Grocery Timer. Uh, you can find it at grocerytimer.app. And it is an app. For both iOS and Mac, he had, I'm sorry, iOS and Android. Android, yeah. And he had built it in Flutter. Um, The description here is a beautiful app that helps you save money and helps the environment by reducing food waste. 
Now, granted, that's slightly a bit aspirational in the context, but basically what that means is it's going to tell you at some point how long you've had a food in your pantry or your fridge or whatever. And based on uh, CDC recommendations, uh, he will be able to tell you when it's possibly time for you to, you know, do something with it, you know. Uh, yeah, it. so basically your your, your pantry, uh, um, when items in your pantry are about to go bad. Your yes, fridge, so exactly, you can... exactly. So basically, Which is useful. basically, you just create a shopping list that you can share with your partner or family. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once you have it at the home, you just say, okay, now yeah, you save it, you can build, and it'll start to have alerts that'll tell you uh, when your app is in danger of expiring. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can also create recipes out of it. It's a fantastic app. It's a subscription-based app, but cost is very small. And I think it's a great app that you should take a look at. And it's... Yeah. It's uh, it's done by a Philadelphia native, so. And I, I want to say two things about it. One, the uh, the idea of having it, having the app remind you when things are about to go bad, or you know, estimates. That's really useful because uh, food, a lot of food gets wasted in my life mm -hmm. because I forget it's in there too long in the fridge. Sure. Like oh, you get busy maybe, and you eat out a couple times in a week or something, and then you the the fresh vegetables you got or the fruit or something. It's suddenly turn, like strawberries are a perfect example of this. If you don't eat strawberries right away, oh, they turn really quick. And yeah. if you had, if I, if I like, had put these in the app, then the yeah. app, see, like, it's, it's people like, laugh it's at like, me. It's, so the app could have told me to eat the strawberries before they went bad. It's, <laughs> but it's like literally like almost like within, a, within a day, like you start to see the molds. It's just like, oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what I'm saying, okay, my example is ridiculous and you should just eat your strawberries and not and like look, you could just look at them. But, you know, there's things that maybe you're going to be in your pantry for longer and, you, sure. and, you know, they have, and you're going to want to be reminded. So it's just, if you're an ultra organized person, this mm -hmm. can be really helpful. Or if you have a lot of, if you have a large pantry, and fridge, mm -hmm. like you have a large household, you have to you have to buy all this stuff. I find even just any kind of grocery list is very useful. For this and the other the other thing I wanted to say about it was that it its UI design is like flat done properly. It's like what mm -hmm. it's like what iOS seven what wished it was way back in the day. It's like it's really nice. It's it's really it's like it's not doesn't have a skeuomorphic design or anything, but mm -hmm. it's but it's colorful in all the right ways. It's it's warm kind of user interface because of the color choices it's interactive in all the right ways and it's it's pretty good even even though it's it's, it's flutter not native it still feels pretty good it's one of those things where i i think when i talk with arpit he always sort of discusses you know he gets a lot of inspiration from other developers but you can tell like he keeps a consistent experience like he has a he has a defined opinion about how he wants his app represented. And he dog foods this app to death. I mean, maybe dog food is a bad term, but like he, he basically, at the very least, he has a user of one plus, like, oh, two, three, uh, one, two, three, 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 three. maybe maybe four or five people, if I had to take a wild guess, of like that he knows that are that need to use it and use it well. Right? Like I think at least he himself um, uses it to a point where he refines it Yep. Over time, you want to talk about continuous development and continuous improvement. Exactly. Like that's what he's doing, right? He's adding, he's added widgets. He's added, uh, he's um, he's built um, sort of like he's redone his layouts a few times based on feedback of people who have actually used it, including himself. Uh, and he's he's uh, he's sort of slowly iterating on this thing it kind of reminds me a lot of um curtis uh herbert uh of uh getslopes.com with his slopes app kind of the same trajectory in terms of like s slow improvements over time of just like this you know i like this thing this thing doesn't work just slow refinements um and because that was not a that was not an overnight app that that app built up to a point where it become it can feel like an overnight app but it was you know it's a very successful uh, mm -hmm. product because it took its time to get there we um we should probably uh look at uh look at arpit and and, and curtis and and maybe try to 
get some inspiration. Do do what they do. Yeah. Of- <laughs> Kaizen. <laughs> we, should, yeah, we should probably try to model ourselves off of their behavior. Sure. That way we could be more successful. We aspire to instead, be like you guys. Instead of, instead of whatever it is we're doing that's not working. <laughs> We are, we are doing it. We're not as fast. We're not as incremental as we should be. But that's true. But uh, yeah, we're yeah, we're we're not at the level of the of the ARPIT or the uh, or the or Curtis. Yeah. But um, yes, but that that is the non sponsor sponsor. So yes, grocery thank you. timer. So, it's it's going to become from now on. It's going to become the thing that I just put everywhere in my presentations and stuff. So yeah, these different we're, different retire, different we're retiring the get slopes one. We're moving on to grossytimer.app. <laughs> There's other apps that we need to do not a sponsor for. There's other people. That's that true. Coca That's true. Area. Oh, well, yeah. stay tuned then. Stay tuned. Yeah, it's maybe, not just going to be Grossy Timer for now and eternity. It's going to be other people too. <laughs> but we'll bring it back to segment to, yes. because it's, it's side project spotlight, and we want mm-hmm. to make sure we're spotlighting these and um, hopefully get, get some of these developers back on the podcast too to talk about it. Yes. It's not just us. <laughs> so ultimately, it's self-serving. <laughs> Oop. Yeah. So cool. Um, I guess then let's we have to move on to state of the mobile union. The uh, state of the mobile union was a great meetup after a long time, both fully Coco. And um, uh, Google Development Group Google, is that GDG Philly? Oh God, the yeah. naming, yeah. G- G- the Go- what is it called? Google it used to be Android Alliance, and yeah. then it became official. So they had to use a Google Development Group, a Google Developer Group. Great uh, naming over there, Google. And so the the both meetups, uh, you know, uh, after COVID was pretty much online. Uh, yep. And so we, you know, but getting back into physical, uh, physical space um, requires us, our, our, you know, collective groups to sort of figure out where we'd actually want to, you know. Surprisingly, surprisingly harder now, it feels like, mm-hmm. than in like 2019 to find space. Sure. Yeah. It's, it's, I don't know. It's not just me, right? Like, it just seems like there's a lot I mean, less people offering uh, space available now. Host, I mean, hosting meetups. maybe, um, there's maybe like we're just all incompetent. The, no, that that's probably more to. We're not persistent. <laughs> we're not persistent enough. I guess. Yeah. yeah. I mean, because I mean, you have to go around to these spaces, places you've never been to before, uh, and and ask yeah. if they have space, and if I, they do, if there's a cost, you know, it's a lot. Yeah, of, I would say that. Uh, uh, also, I would say that it, it seems only kind of recently, like mm-hmm. this, even this year and late last year, that the meetup tech scene started started to come back. I, yeah, I, yeah. It really is surprisingly how long it's taken to get the in-person stuff back. But now I see a lot more in-person events happening. Not as many as pre-pandemic, no, but it's no, coming back. It's coming back. Um, the 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 challenge is, you know, again, it's logistics. But um, yeah, but you found a great spot. Or yeah, yeah, you, it was great. Um, so the Lyft Labs at the Comcast uh, Tech Building or Tech Center, Technology Center, oh, is Tech uh, Center. Okay. Technology Center, yeah, Comcast Technology Center is a great space. Uh, it was so, very cool. So they partnered with us um, to set up a State of the Union, State of the Mobile Union talk, which basically was five lightning talks of various different topics around mobile. Uh, so you had one that was um, one that stood out in my mind was like the UI declarative uh, UI kit. <laughs> Which, yeah, that was that was good. That was nice. Uh, other one was like um, how to how to inspect and um, reduce the fat in your app binary. Uh, oh, by yeah, our good yeah. friend Mohammed uh, Fani. Uh, hopefully, I pronounce his last name right. Um, yep. And then um, we had a Firebase one. We had a Flutter one, and then we had mine. <laughs> Yeah, and then you, where you got you got you got like passionate up there. There's no, there's no video of this, but but, yeah, but it was it was no, there was uh, it was like whoa, your hatred of Jira came through. It was great. Oh, dude, yeah, and I, I should have. I, and so that's why I do apologize for that because I don't I don't want to. You don't need speak, to apologize to, to Jira. Jira doesn't. No, care. no, Jira doesn't care. But like the you know maybe people there might have been like pro Jira or you know some people right like just like I don't know if Jira's anybody's so pro bad. Jira as much as they're like accepting of it like I'm just accepting them like it's I've used a lot of terrible tools I've seen worse I've seen better 
Eh. So I think. Yeah. So in in my case, so the talk was around this idea about um, sort of immersive UI. Um, yes, that's the word I was looking for. I think earlier for describing yeah. the, what you're kind of doing with our app. It's like a little. Yeah. It's it's a more. It's not skeuomorphic. It's not super flat. Mm-hmm. And you're also adding some nice animations. I think yeah. it's just it's a lot of it's, it's the, some of it stems from the fact that game development and game games in, uh, on any platform, um, the developer is responsible for the entire Chrome. And what that means is like traditionally in iOS, you have like Apple, you know, it's like, OK, if I do a push navigation, I have a nav bar, I have a tab bar, I do, you know, present modal or push navigation, you know, whatever, you know term you want to that's familiar to you but you're still using like the apple nav bar the tab bar you can do modifications and refinements you know that's typical too but generally speaking you're pretty much using a good chunk of the um the ui kit framework or the or storyboards or whatever to sort of uh you let apple sort of control the sort of ui uh, narrative right whereas i think in game design it's like no we're doing the whole thing ourselves like this is yeah everything from the font the text the animations the transitions the 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 experience is totally owned by the app developer or the game developer uh and so it's it's you know all over the place in terms of like good and bad ux but it 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 almost celebrates in its its sort of like you know badness i guess if you want to call it that like you know the funny thing like people complain about elden rings uh ui (laughs) <laughs> because it's such a frustrating ui yeah i remember that <laughs> but but the counter argument is is like that's the point the point is that you're supposed to feel frustrated about everything about this game um because the game is not going to be the game is trying to like sell a hint like this thing is not easy <laughs> everything about this thing is not easy um and i mean that's you know that's a you know one could argue that's an excuse but like to me i think like that adds in a bizarre way that sort of adds to the experience of the game um whether you like it or not you still remember like how that made you feel yeah right? I, i'll um, say that the opposite in the spectrum mm-hmm. kirby and the forgotten land which is this the, this uh, 3d platformer came out on the switch that has like the easiest gameplay controls and mechanics of any game i think i've ever played i mean because it's geared towards kids I thought that was a good game it is a good game especially if you're a kid like it's super super easy mm-hmm. if you're above the age of like you know, 10 mm-hmm. or whatever, but it, it doesn't matter. It's still, it has a lot of fun little mechanics. The point, my point is it's like the gameplay and the, and the UI is all eminently understandable, even from, for a child. It's like, it's very well designed. I think in that respect, well, especially that, the gameplay. I mean, that's the thing. Like games in general have to be that way because they're, they, they, they it's like a social contract of saying, Hey, I'm going to, you trust me, you know, I'm going to make sure it's easy enough for you to get to grok to get from point A to point B. Yeah. Um, so they have to make things more or less super obvious and they use skeuomorphism in a lot of ways to like emphasize certain points of like immersion. And I think with you know, the advent you know, like of like when, when Kirby swallows like a, like a car, right. it totally looks like what I expect Kirby to look like. Right. He's like, a car. I always refer back to persona five, which is a yes. JRPG game, um, that you can get on any platform nowadays, but it's just this game that just oozes a personality mm-hmm. and, it's, and its UI is just confidently like expressed so that it's readable, but it's you know, most sort of <laughs> kind of readable, but it's like it can transition real nicely and the transitions is what makes it fantastic. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta look at screenshots of that to understand what, what yeah. Kota was talking about, but it's uh, it's really cool. It's, yeah. it's very, it's very, it, I don't know. It's 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 very opinionated, <laughs> right? And it has a style, right? And it's I very think, stylized, yeah. And I think now you can kind of use Swift UI to do the same thing for your apps. Where yes, you're still using technically you can you're using majority of the Chrome in um, iOS, um, but it gives you hooks to allow you to make them um, uh, more animatable, more yeah. expressive more stylized um and the transitions can be a little more absurd and And uh, you don't have to rely on that too right you can incorporate um scene kit or you can incorporate 3d uh 2d effects uh in a variety of different mix of ways i think apple without probably realizing it gives you so much um tools 
to churn it out. And, and SwiftUI is just more like an easy conduit to like galvanize these tools together to mm. create sort of an even more absurd experience if you yeah, wanted to. I, I remember Apple was pushing a lot of frameworks shortly after iOS 7 and the, it, was early, it was released after that sure. to give you like these, these animations and particle effects and all sort of stuff. And I feel like what the problem was was UI kit was part of the problem. Like it was much harder to use some of those tools sure. than it is now. So it's like yeah. it's like Swift UI lets you just incorporate that stuff. As you said, you can incorporate the existing like, you know, three D and two D animation frameworks. You can just use the built in animations. You can you know, just you can just draw stuff in Swift UI and it's just easier yeah 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 like they have canvas view for you to do yeah. all sorts of it just keeps getting easier every, every time they update it it just it just gets simpler like more straightforward i'll say you know to make so, so that i i'm not a you know big designer guy mm -hmm. so but i can i can mess around with swift ui and do things that i could not do in ui kit or would choose not to because it would be so much boilerplate yeah, I mean, I, I kind of now I'm beginning to see a lot of Mac apps that have um, that have come out on the Mac App Store. Uh, speaking of a pseudo renaissance, I feel like that's happening there. Is... Yes, because all the iOS apps are like <laughs> right, <laughs> but which like... is Apple's point. That's what they wanted to do, and that's what right, that's right. what was expected to happen. And despite the complaints from people that said like it's not going to be very good apps, I think some of them are pretty good. I mean, that's the, well, the, the the point is like they're not good and if you were comparing them like a well done app kit app but they yeah. are they're solid in the yes. sense that and we are the end user in this case and yeah. we have we we often think that's oh, good enough right well, in, in the case of like we take a like an app like fabula right where it's just a lot of swift ui examples um and they use a detail view to sort of let the mm -hmm. the swift ui component self-express itself and everything else is you know um, Mac OS Chrome, which, yeah. you know, is fair. Like, yeah, not great. Not not the best in the world, but it's enough to, like, convey, like, okay, you can go check out, you know, go here. Here's a list of uh, Swift UI code or Swift UI examples. Try each one out. It's very simple. And, like, yeah. that's the pattern. Yeah. Um, we should probably have a whole whole episode on just immersive UI and all the different examples yeah, we can come up yeah. with again. Because yeah. it's, it's, I think it's a good a name for the concept that uh that i'm gonna give cultural credit for inventing uh, and, well uh, you, i used to call it irrational anime or irrational design or something you know there's like skeuomorphism yeah. and um and then flat and then material and then like i was like i was thinking like what is the next version what's immersive. the next no i like this because it, it is it's exactly what it sounds like mm -hmm. you take ideas and cultural's talk was really good about this um, ah, thank uh, you. I don't know if you have the slides or something somewhere, but you should at least give that because you didn't record it. it. Mm -hmm. Right. But it, it, the idea of taking the video game concepts mm -hmm. and apply them to regular old apps. Like I'm sure other people have, have talked about this in the past before, but you have a nice little brand I, name for your concept now. So it's going to catch on like wildfire because everyone, everyone in the Apple community. Hashtag this immersive podcast, UI. Right? Yeah, yes. I, I, I mean, honestly, <laughs> though, it, it, it's one of the things that I know has been kind of a trend yeah. that that's been happening so it's, it's it predates whatever naming convention that yes. i had for it but it was basically uh you had casoff you had design code mm -hmm. you had a lot of these forefront people um a lot of the early swift ui people all experimented in this space mm -hmm. um so they get a, a huge yeah. majority credit but for that. but you synthesize the concepts in your talk and in, into this in this little coherent you know what was like five or ten minute mm -hmm. presentation and oh, introduced it to, to everybody with with a little sprinkling of passion and jira hate <laughs> added spice and it was really it was really good ender to the evening i think it was great and it, the funny thing is i think it was originally a talk you weren't planning on doing right it was just because no. you needed to find you need to I fill a spot i needed one like i was hoping we'd have an accessibility one which i right. still feel like is is an essential part of the story um for a variety of reasons but um that kind of fell through so i had to like quickly like well uh quickly okay. like uh whip up one and so that that's that uh that turned out pretty well so anyway Indeed. hopefully we can have an 
maybe there'll be another one in the future. We'll see. Yeah. So uh, future events, <clears throat> we're working on it mm-hmm. for everything, including this kind of thing. Sure. Uh, I think we're going to do another State of the Mobile Union. I hope we can do that annually because that seems like it's a think... good thing to do annually, that particular one. I will say um, just maybe in, in the future, we want to think one, we're thinking of one of that's a little more forward thinking and sort of like present. Thinking. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's. I think, I think what we need is like, um, uh, we, w- we want ideally to do one a quarter, right? If we could. If we could. Of one of these types of events. And then I think Stay of the Minimum Union is a good one to do mm. in the beginning of the year, like an annual uh, one, because it's like, it's like a check in a year. And then we just need like three other ones. That are that are around slightly different different themes. I think one of the ones is like I I, I don't want to label it too soon, but something like mobile future or mobile forward or something like that, where yeah. the idea is like mobile is beyond just a phone, but you can say like a watch or maybe a rumored Apple glasses as an example. Oh my god, is that is that is that a segue? <clears throat> I'm not pointing what? that out or anything as a what? segue. <laughs> We're like 45 <laughs> minutes in. We finally get to the topic. Damn and we actually Steven. have a segue. That was Steven. You, you, you ruined our transition. <laughs> yes. No, that was a good segue into... Uh, <laughs> so stay tuned for future topics. But the uh, that's a good segue into... Um, apparently, um, this is the year, finally. This year, we're going to have Apple classes, right? Well, that, allegedly. That's, allegedly. That's... So, yeah. Look, so this all came up because we were, we were talking before the podcast... Uh, we were all passing around our, our comments in the Slack over last week on this uh, the Decentraland video <laughs> on YouTube. Um, wait, what is that called? I gotta find folding, the folding. Gotta... Folding yeah. the, the guy who who. Oh yeah, legendary... so folding ideas, and the, the the video is called "The Future Is a Dead Mall: Decentraland and the Metaverse," and it is a like movie length takedown. Of, of Decentraland specifically, and somewhat also of the incoherence of the current state of the concept, the metaverse. But it's it has a lot of good stuff. We're not going to be spending the uh, the whole time talking about it. I'll put a link in the show notes because it's worth watching and coming to your own ideas about it. But it did get in the forefront of our mind that hey, um, this stuff is kind of back in the the zeitgeist again, despite the fact that AI has been taking up all the, all the oxygen. Because also app the rumors from Apple uh, about Apple doing some kind of AR VR goggles glasses head mounted thing are 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 you know even even bigger now like there's more smoke now on that so I think it it may actually happen this year at WWDC. You mean our WWDC bingo card will have uh... <laughs> it'll finally it'll finally get. We should checked put off. that in the middle of the bingo card just to like piss people oh, off. No free space. It just has <laughs> yeah. to be AR glasses. <laughs> That's that's great. We should totally do that. Oh. That's gonna piss off so many people. It's gonna be funny. Oh, uh, yes. <laughs> but the the uh, oh my god. But, but so yeah. So the the air stuff. Uh, okay. First of all, do we actually think it's gonna happen? I think there's enough smoke that they'll say something this year. Like there's a lot, a lot of a lot of the insiders are saying, yeah, we're gonna do something. They're gonna do something. What do you think, Aaron? I don't know. It's too. We we got burned too many times before. <laughs> so <laughs> we so did. so we, we here's how here's what I I think personally is that WDC the keynote itself is very long, um, and oh, yeah, it's it is. very long and dry nowadays. There's not like um, because they have to be they they have to explain what's what's happening in each particular platform. You know, so you have the Mac, the iOS, the tvOS, maybe well, okay, maybe not tvOS as much, but the watch OS. They have to explain like what's new in all of these platforms, right? So to give space for like re or whatever this reality OS or whatever we we're calling it, right? Um like and it has to take up a big chunk because that's the that's the that's the money segment. Yeah. Um like I don't know if it's um I don't know if they can do anything more than just saying we're doing something called reality OS, right? And maybe they're like they keep it very broad, but they won't say. Uh, they they might even say we are going to have a dev kit of some kind, right? And that maybe this whole rumor is all around that dev kit. Yeah, yeah. Because it doesn't make like any new product, um, any new product segment that Apple ever does, they always have a keynote. I won't. I would say always, but but you usually have a keynote. Even the even the iPhone segment 
uh, the iPhone, which was done in Macworld, right? They pretty much had like, blah, 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 blah. Oh, here's some general new eyes item. Now we're getting to the real meat of it, iPhone. And then that was pretty much the whole keynote, right? Versus like, and then so since then, we've had dedicated ones for like watchOS, dedicated ones. iPad, right? iPad, dedicated ones for iPod. like. iPod. Like iPod. All this stuff. Yeah. And, and uh, <laughs> the, uh, and I, I don't, I don't think they would announce brand new market segment hardware at WWDC. Right. Would they? I mean, that's, I mean, it's, it, I, mm, it, it, it sounds it, like a newish idea. It sounds like, like, it sounds like them to do something like that, but that would be like during a Steve Jobs era. Yeah, maybe they might announce the platform. They might announce the platform. Yeah, as a, and here's the dev kit. Right, but then they'd have to announce stuff. But they have mm-hmm. to announce the product. I mean, okay, so they can go two ways. Yeah, right. They could say, <clears throat> they could say, here's this platform here, and be kind of like they've done that before, where they kind of product in the yeah, palm. yeah, mystery, or even less than that, they just have these APIs that are mysteriously point to the direction of a particular product. Mm-hmm. Like like last year, the obvious one was the the stuff about uh, always on display. Like there were these APIs, and were like the only reason that these APIs exist, like the main reason you'd use them would be if you had an always-on display, but we didn't have an iPhone 14 yet with an always-on display. So, hmm, what are these for? And they were, like, very cagey about it, right? Sure. But And then and then it was released, and I was like, oh, right, obviously. Maybe it'll be like that again, or mm-hmm. maybe they'll do a announcement before WWDC. I doubt it. It's already April mm-hmm. when we're recording this. So, uh, I don't know. I'm, I, I'm tough. I don't know, but I think they will have some software for us to play with at least at uh, right around there they have to have something because they would want app developers to build apps for it that makes sense i think it it's just a question of like do they show the actual product right i don't know like how do you how do you do a dev kit without showing something for for this because it's a different market segment and it's and it and it works differently and there's things like potentially sensors to you know to track your eye movement and there's like different two different displays that you'd have to have synchronized and a lot of it could be built on top of the existing apis that already exist for like ar kit and and such but uh i don't know i I just i guess the question is when is apple going to announce they have a product because it does really seem clear that they have a product and that there may be even some internal tension based on some of the rumors uh you know inside apple about whether or not you know it should be released yet so you know, when are they going to announce something? Uh, would they do it at WWC? Uh, I don't know. But I think they, w- so I'm going to go out on the limb and say probably do it. But I don't think, I don't think um, it'll be the way we would expect it to be. In yeah, sense maybe. Because they don't, they can't. You know what? I mean, it, because the rumor is that this headset is, Matt, is like, uh, has like an external battery pack. I don't know if that's always true, but they, the rumor is it's going to be expensive. It's not going to be like a two hundred dollar device or even five hundred device. It might be in the thousands. It might be as much as as an expensive MacBook Pro or something. Mm-hmm. If if that is the case, I mean, you could just announce it and and be like, it's coming later, and here's Dev Kit stuff mm-hmm. for it because it's not expected to be a mainstream thing. But then on the other hand, does Apple ever release anything that they don't? expect or desire to be a mainstream consumer product that's what's right. so weird about this based the mm-hmm. rumors are so confusing if if some of the rumors are true it, it does really seem like a very niche product which seems odd for apple if that's the case so i think i think what people are saying that how this would work mm-hmm. uh, at least in, maybe from the justification standpoint is like they want to build one that gets out in the wild right so very much like a watch zero situation yeah. Even though I think Watch Zero was like they were confident of what it was when it was released, and then maybe afterwards they realized this is not exactly how people view this this product, this Apple Watch, and so they they churned it from like a luxury item, mm-hmm. aspirational item thing to what it is today, nice. which is a yeah. health fitness tracking. <laughs> Wasn't there like a ten thousand dollar version of that watch sure. or something when it first came watch. out? What? Was it, it like, was like gold? the gold edition? Yep. Yeah, I mean that's insane to me. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's I mean, one expensive paperweight now. Yeah, and no, it, it it was it was superseded by the very next version of the watch. I think. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't until like series like, three that they they yeah. figured like they really figured everything out. Um, 
and even then like nowadays it's even like series three is like the uncle or the old grandpa and like it is, yeah and that's they haven't really the processor hasn't even really improved since like five that much right um that i don't remember but i'm, I'm I feel, sure I feel it's, like it's been very incremental since five with the processor performance yeah it doesn't but, surprise me you know but yeah watch it be think of it like a watch zero mm-hmm. that's it's it's going to be risky to buy it yeah unless you're unless you really want to you know, use it as a dev kit and to explore the possibilities of the space mm-hmm. like how do i bring immersive ui to ar well i think the the whole thing about that is that you know version one strikes me as something where your widgets are going to become much more empowered to do much mm-hmm. more interesting things for this version. That's my guess. Yeah, I, I think there's, yeah, I think the, I was going to say, what do you think the killer app is going to be? They're going to announce with this, like the primary use case. I think it's probably going to be, at least one of them is going to be like co-presence uh, because that is kind of the obvious thing you'd use something like this for. Cause if it, it's basically almost certainly going to be a, uh, like a VR headset of some sort, with mm-hmm. pass through for for like augmented reality stuff it's not it's not obviously not gonna be like like regular glasses like sci-fi things it's gonna be a, a an encompassing thing otherwise it won't mm-hmm. work and apple is not great at games although i'm sure they will mention games but that's not like the primary reason that you would buy this thing no that seems ridiculous no. to me to think that that's what they would go for but uh and so what else what else would it be for because most I mean, most you, a, a, you, VR you, sets are game driven. Day, day one will at least have Beat Saber. That's for sure. Yeah, I mean, Beat Saber would be awesome because <laughs> that seems um, fun. Uh, but I'm saying co presence mm-hmm. might be a thing they they push, and so the, uh, and the AR aspect of it they'll they'll push, and yeah. that's the part where you have your widgets and things. But like, what's what's the angle that that Apple could come at to to sell it to normal people to be like this is useful. To wear a battery pack on your waist and a, and a headset on your in your head and well, goggles well, on your head. The thing that is is striking when we review a lot of the um this what they're telegraphing with a lot of the stuff that they put into AR Kit, Reality yeah. Kit, uh, Reality Composer, Reality um uh, was it Reality Converter or I forgot what the other one. But basically, yeah. all these tools to allow you to build whether three D models, three D experiences, uh, object detection with vi- their vision framework, right? So like. The vision framework allows for you to object detect, allows you to people detect, allows you to detect um, your index of your hands, all the oh, yeah. all your digits of your hands. Hand if gestures all... is a rumor for controlling this thing. Right. I mean, that's perfect for like if I have my hands here, it can it will actually see and it has a front facing camera that can or back facing camera. Yeah, you know whatever a camera that extends out to the world, right? Yeah. With a lidar scanner, I assume that can spec out the world and kind of do a 3d graph of the world yeah um you kind of bring it all together when we talk about this emerging ui right like mm-hmm. it goes back to like it would be great if i could see night vision or it'd be great if i can see predator um, mode. yeah predator mode or you know it'd be great if i could zoom in or zoom out or it would be fantastic yeah. if i didn't need my glasses because the the um the goggles are doing the 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 Focal length adjustment for me. R- rumor is that you can the uh, all these is rumors, so we don't know. It's probably not going to be exactly like any of this stuff. But mm-hmm. rumor is you'll be able to get inserts, yeah. like you get prescription lenses to put in there, which is right. interesting because uh, the because what part of that rumor was that it doesn't fit over glasses, which is interesting because sure. even if that's true, just think about it. Because I think the other the other headsets do, don't they fit over glasses? Yeah, yeah they do. So if they doesn't fit over glasses, that gives you an idea of how it is. It would have to be significantly thinner, or at least it would be a lot closer to your face, sure. like the actual yeah. screens. Like, so I mean, if it's a ski, like the, if it's a ski mask thing, right? Like, yeah, which is what I all mean, the renders this be, are. Be, this would be fantastic for Curtis. You're like, you know what? Screw my ski mask. I'm just going to wear oh. this goggle down. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and then we have, and then you could use like the map view. Right? Seems the, so dangerous. It's like yeah, well, depends. Mode. Is it going to update even, fast enough? It'll have like a speed, a speedometer. No, I mean, is, have... will, will the will the screens update fast enough while you're moving to be able to like accurately, you know, see I mean, movement? I mean, that's you... what you're paying the three thousand dollars for. I, guess. I know. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, but that that's a good good point, question. Is it is it something that you think the version zero here is going to be ex- you'd be expected to wear in public, or something you expect to just use in your office? I mean, I'm sure home, Apple Apple. Apple will 
will say, sure, you can wear this outside, but no self-respecting they... person would wear a Unless it has transparent uh, lenses and some kind of see-through display, it would be extremely unsafe to wear. Have outside. your... Yeah, yeah have your Have your... um. Um, what are those emoji guys called? What are those things called from uh, messages? Animojis. Is it animoji of yourself? Oh yeah, yeah, just have, yeah. Just have that like good. displayed on the on screen on the front of it, so you just have like your face doing matching your facial expressions. Yes. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, the, you got to think like it's got to know to some extent like your eye movements, right? And then if you yeah. whatever you're saying, it'll just try to do its best to like redo like like animate the th- stuff that you're saying yeah if we're so, talking again, about like, but again like what's what's watch zero version what are the what's the primary use cases you think for this thing okay so embedded m- map view so like base if we're talking like ar right a specific yeah. tool use I, cases. I think they're gonna push the whole ar angle i feel like mm-hmm. that's They've been right. pushing that for on the, in so, the tooling for so years. So infographics around all your spaces. So imagine like map apps on AR, right? What, yeah. what will be the use case? Um, you're already in Street View, so you get all the benefits of like Street Views kind of like direction. Like they've already sort of they already demonstrated something like yeah, that yeah. where you can get like a Street View version of directions and it'll kind of like guide you to whatever. So you have a walk mode version of that mm-hmm. of like. I want to go to Starbucks around the corner. It'll give you like a blue trail for you to follow, right? In AR mm-hmm. mode, that's that's an easy example. Um, text um, translations or subtitles. So if somebody's talk, talking to you, and maybe you're not good at hearing or whatever, imagine you can just get the subtitles of that text. Like imagine how awesome that would be for somebody who is um, deaf that can. I hope that's the politically correct term these days, but. Um, or hard of hearing, really, right? You can just see the subtitle of what they're saying and get the gist of the conversation. Or imagine if they're speaking Spanish or speaking some other foreign language, you can get the transcript of that and get translation as a, like a, a subtitle, right? That would be awesome. Um, or even do it in like Apple's way where maybe they do it as a word balloon <laughs> in, uh, coming out of their mouth, right? <laughs> you know, like that would be awesome. Um, uh, you could do, um, if you... Let's say Child Finder or Find My, right? You mm-hmm. can't, if you have a, you know how children are when they like run away from their parents and like, in, of course they run away from them in a crowd, right? But then if you had like oh, yeah. a little like drop pin that could like isolate where they are, you can just put that on and be like, there they are. Because, yeah. you know, maybe you have air tags on them or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? Air tag your kids, everybody. <laughs> I, I, should I, be a, I should be an Apple so spokesman for this kind of these, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> These ideas to me, though, strike me as something better fit for a lightweight product. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know if they're going to push it for some of the, they're going to push this for going outside in the world with. Although, here's mm-hmm. some cases that come to my mind, okay? Reading the tea leaves about this stuff, you're in your office, you put these things on, you look at your Mac and, you know, with the pass through screens, and then that's where you get the extended desktop view with your widgets, maybe even a bigger screen or utility screens, that kind of thing. You have the hand movement stuff. So here's where you can go into either VR or an augmented reality view, and now you can use your hand to directly manipulate things you're working on. So that could be like 3D objects that you're doing design work for. So I think that would be a demo where you're doing like architecture diagrams or something, and you can now just manipulate it, you know, like Iron Man style, you know, like in 3D with your hand gestures because that to me feels Apple-y. It feels like they, they had, as you said earlier, they had a skeuomorphic design originally to try to teach people how to use a touch screen. Now they're going to need to teach people how to use and interact with virtual objects in the real world and in VR and move back and forth between these things. So I feel like they're going to, they would push an idea of, of using your hands to manipulate things in AR in front of you, and then also use the glasses to just get, as you said, extended metadata and things about about you. But I think it's going to be primarily focused in your home, so like in your office and in your living room. And what are the use cases there? Because I, I just don't see this as being particularly like Generation One or Generation Zero being particularly great for walking around outside. I'm not saying you can't do that or they won't have something for that, but it seems, as Aaron has pointed out before seems kind of dangerous <laughs> like, you know and well, just to walk just, around with just, something on your just, face just look at this right like i'm like if i'm touching like i'm not I'm, now i'm touching my screen but the whole point is like of course you when when you're in this vr space you're doing this a lot right you're doing yeah you're moving your hands in, in like 
uh, all sorts of different directions. Imagine you on a Zoom call and it's like, hey, Kotaro, can you show us your 3D model that you did? I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, here, well, right. zoom in, in and zoom out. Co- here's co- my presence. hand all over. And here's That's my the thing hand about the co-presence. All over. If, if we were all in this call with these headsets on, and we wanted to talk about some some artifact, especially a three D one. Then yeah, that could that could actually make a lot of no, sense. No, you Steve, it, you, you know, if you were the one in the headset, I would be the one taking a picture of you, taking yeah. a screenshot of you. Yeah. Look how silly this guy looks. Well, right. If you see the meta <laughs> meta presentation from a couple well, a year or two ago, mm-hmm. you know they have the examples and of the and you can use the VR chat now, I guess, right? You get mm-hmm. the, the idea when you have somebody who's not on VR and they have to come into a VR world. They're just like on a screen or something. Mm-hmm. And it works, but it's, it's a little weird. But and if everybody's on VR though, then it ha- it's a much more immersive experience. So, but so in I'm other not... words, everybody has to shell out three thousand dollars. <laughs> yes, that sounds like an Apple thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> the best experience is with the Apple headset, whatever they're going to call it. But it'll, it'll be I, the iMessage of. Yeah. of... <laughs> I do think direct direct manipulation can be useful in some circumstances, depending on the resolution of the hand gesture kind of a uh, uh, um, you know UI. But the thing that strike like one thing that why you know Facebook or I'm sorry Meta comes with these controllers is that there's no tactile response, right? Like you have to at least feel like yeah you are. Have the, you seen those haptic gloves? They're gonna have haptic things. gloves, Apple gloves. No, Apple so with haptic gloves. It'll be like they'll be like magic gloves. So probably so so here's here's my suggestion. I think it's I think it's more maybe it's more <laughs> haptic gloves. Maybe it's more gesture based. Right. Sure. So it's not yeah. it's not like you literally like f- like do the gesture of grabbing something, but it's more like you do the swipe gesture to move around. You 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 do something with your hands that is more just vaguely gesture based and then maybe even you could use the eyes to track the thing you're looking at so if i'm looking at this object that per- add creates the focus because we have the focus engine right we've had that for years now yeah right no, no but coach think about it this way what if i'm looking at something and i'm, I'm not talking about a, a, like a co-presence like i'm working by myself i look at something that is what the focus uh goes to and then i can use gestures to manipulate it and if it's a 3D object, that that can make sense. I could just go. I could. You can't see this because you're listening to this podcast. But I'm doing these wild hand gestures right now that looks ridiculous <laughs> to to demonstrate the culture of what I imagine might happen. Okay, okay. Okay. Now picture that in your mind, right? Just picture, like, <laughs> picture Steve on with his goggles. I know this is, this is painful at, at to picture home, me but. at home, gyrating his hands furiously, <laughs> and and and. And then Chrissy comes in and it's like, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm I'm manipulating a 3D Jira. model. Jira, yeah, right. What what am I doing? I'm moving issues you're moving from the all to your do fa- column into <laughs> the done column. You 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 throw you're going through all your your issues. I'm going through my epics. My, you're all your you know, you're going into your in, you're going into your epics, so you open up I'm a going fence. Into my epic. I'm opening. <laughs> see, you, and, and I wish you, you could see then, this people. And then you then. scroll furiously to the issue involved. Yes. This is much funnier if we did this as a YouTube show, but uh, can imagine me wildly moving my hands around. I mean, so, nothing, I don't there's, there's nothing goofy looking about that at all. No, not at all. <laughs> uh, so this is why I think maybe if the rumors are true that there's some kind of internal conflict between some people about this, some of it might be around the fact that it's really hard to figure out what is a particularly super useful thing to do with this that's going to sell the units because like what's the killer app of something if the rumor again is all if the rumor is true if the rumors are true we're talking about some goggles it might be lightweight because they move the battery pack off the goggles onto something you have to wear on your waist which i'm not saying it'd be huge or anything but like a little battery pack and that means you have to have a wire and then you, you still have the issue of screens in front of your eyes and all the stuff that could potentially happen then you have cameras bringing things in and you, you have this expensive thing that you have to wear and who knows how long the battery lasts. And I don't know what's doing the processing. There were rumors that it was going to be your iPhone at one point, And I think, it, or it's going to be all internal. And if it's all internal, what's the, like, I don't know what it's doing. So like, what, what do you use this thing for? Maybe if it's lightweight enough and the battery pack is small enough, you could just wear it around. I, I mean, there, there was a goofy rumor and it, sound, it seems goofy, but like watch Apple do it. You know, like the goofy rumor that it has a screen on the front that can like show your facial expressions or show like a pass through of your face or something. <laughs> and I'm like, that sounds like a terribly creepy looking thing. I don't think that's going to happen. Look, you're going to have like and emojis. Cat, I can cat, see that. Yeah. Cat, 
cat eyes or something. Cat eyes or some crap I mean, like that. that. Like, no, I don't funny. think so. I don't think they do that. I, I don't one, think th- I, one thing I thought would be really cool is like if somebody starts selling, I'm sure this is out there. Wear like a sub zero like, like a yeah LED light. LED light that'll like mask. that'll be like like instead of like having your regular <laughs> mouth, it'll be like your digital like a digital like LED light <laughs> of like you just you've just invented a helmet. No, but it'll be you know, like a mask. So it'd be I like, know, but it goes over, over your eyes but, and your mouth. But like, why? <laughs> yeah. Why? Because oh, cause, so you because people can't tell what you're saying, right? It, uh, behind a mask. But imagine if it could figure out like the shape of your your lips. It will just simulate like a bear, like instead of like like a cat smile, you know. Just but like, why are you wearing the mask? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Why with have the you, goggles? Have you, well, oh, with the goggles? Oh, I just meant the mask. I oh, like I the, thought you meant like I'm gonna take I'm gonna take like a Sub Zero mask, and I'm right. gonna have the goggles on, and right. I need this. I need the mask to show my facial expressions and my eye. No, I was just right. thinking much more like a, a COVID mask, but like one of those like nice ones. But with, well, like, they had those LED. goofy ones that were like see through. Oh yeah, yeah, those 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 are no fun. I'm talking about ones where it has like have LED ones. lights yeah. that will just like show up and bright, like so you have like a cat smile or like a one of those weird anime shark smiles or whatever. Um, oh, sorry, I digress. The uh, if you put those two together, that would actually kind of be funny too. But probably. Yeah. So I don't I don't know what's gonna happen with these uh the guys I'm lo- I'm looking forward to June WWC just got announced was it June fifth June fifth to the ninth or something I'm gonna have yeah. to take my take some vacation time there Whew. uh it's gonna that's be online sick. again mm-hmm. so that's, that's cool yeah. uh, unless, unless you have something you have uh, time and money to go down to the to the yeah. spaceship I mean I wish I wish uh, that would be kind of cool but it's they they are gonna have an in person thing just like last year I think this is. This is good. It does seem like this is the new way that Apple's doing it. There's really no reason they couldn't do a full on this is year, there, like in person. But this, this is probably better. this probably should be a little um, a little segment for next uh, yeah. for our next or podcast or some podcast in the future. But uh, I'm just kind of curious, hot, hot hot take desires or what you would yeah. like to see come out of WWDC. Yeah, but uh, for now, there you should check out the WWDC announcement page and. I know there's some kind of I think student contest to get mm-hmm. seats sure. at the um the keynote. Yeah. And uh you can you can do the whole like what does the logo mean thing. Um usually means nothing. Sometimes it means something slightly. Usually it it's it's usually a misdirect in a weird yeah, way. Yeah, it's usually a misdirect. So, so, so maybe that maybe that's their misdirect of saying, Ha ha, see, uh-huh. there really wasn't any AR classes. We just suckered you. Yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nothing. I know if watch watch WC come on and all it is is all these nice to have updates to iOS, mm-hmm. bug fixes, some no giant new features, just like yeah. Things that we've been asking for for years that they finally fix, and that's all it is. And then we're gonna, like, we're we gonna just be move like, on. we're going to be like meta this time. We're we're just, gonna be everything's like, going to be. This is going to be year of efficiency. <laughs> yes. Well, that was another rumor which we didn't talk about about like iOS anyway. That it was originally seventeen was supposed to be just bug fixes and like, um, you know, and and now it's just now it's going to be like bug fixes and some nice some some long something like long standing feature requests or something. But not no big ticket items like the redesigned home screen or redesigned lock screen like last year. Do you think Sean will get his wish? Sean and maybe Ozzy will get their wish of a Swifty core data. That is what I want. I went I, now that I've been using core data a little bit with Swift UI, um, and it, that the friction that it causes is not See, unbearable. This, but this is this is where we're going to get ourselves in trouble, right? Like we're, we're definitely probably not going to finish this app by. WWDC and imagine. then we're gonna change it up again because <laughs> they, <laughs> right. they do a new a new switch. Because look, here's the thing: I've been watching Azam stuff, and we're so far over time. I don't care because this is this a passion about this. Okay. So the uh, the the architectural design for SwiftUI, I think in my head, I find I understand what Apple wants you to do. They Apple is really wants you to to to, to do this to do the swift ui thing and bring in your models using like property wrappers primarily as your primary interface and like that's your state management and then your view struct is just your description of your view and you have lots of these views and they're very very small and you use the the, the property wrappers around state to to specifically and ex- explicitly define what what your life cycle of your state is and who owns it and et cetera. And then you use bindings to, as your primary means of doing communication between different views. So bring in core data and it's like, yeah, it has support for working in Swift UI, but what you really often want to do is design your model at with structs and 
you can get these nice this nice scenario where you get data from the internet, you get it from an API, and you convert it into a nice struct with codable, and then you can then just y- use that model. Like you don't have to do an intermediary now. When you're doing with core data, you're constantly at this tension where like it's if you need to get data from the internet. If it's not just user created data, this is where the, my 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 problem comes. If it's user created data, it's pretty straightforward. You make it, you put it in core data, you bring it out of core data, it works fine. But you you but because core data has these like little friction cases. Like by default, you get like optionals and stuff like that. But if you if you're getting stuff from the internet, what are you supposed to do? Like, do you just convert directly to core data which you can technically do but then you have the limitations of core data's uh, types mm-hmm. right or do you do you convert to structs as a dto object and then you convert over to core data now that's that works but now again now you're like converting back and forth and you still have this limitation of well whatever i'm converting has to work inside core data and there's ways of working around this mm-hmm. it, it, it it just you get to this point where you're like what's my data model because you're, you're making things you're making things harder for me if I have to combine core data and stuff from the internet. And because you can't make this nice clean abstraction like Asm has demonstrated with his, some of his articles and videos, he has this nice aggregate model view and Apple talks about this too. And it, it, all, of Apple's, all of Apple's examples are like build a struct, build a struct, build a struct. Everything is value types and everything is built on that assumption and then you want to use core data and it's, it's, it gets complicated. It's like, it makes sense for your model data to be a, a reference type, but mm-hmm. it the core data ness of core data creates some friction points, and they've done a lot of good jobs to it. But if they created a core data replacement that just vended structs, like sometimes it would be nice. Or if they or created just, something, or just allows for the conversion to be done without you having to think about it too. Deep. Yeah, so like a, yeah. Like I a, mean, a fetch request too that ultimately. Um, yeah. com- uh, conforms to some kind of codable uh, that we you can sort of just pass it in to um, you know whatever you get an array of structs of codable structs that you can work with you send it back and core data uh, you, you know Swift UI or whatever the property wrappers would do all the conversion yeah yeah exactly now and um I was and we're, we're so far over time but we're gonna talk about this another time because mm-hmm. I've been doing like a lot of work uh, looking at advanced property wrapper development mm-hmm. yeah. and. Because what I wanted was a replacement for the fetch request wrapper, mm-hmm. which also made an API call and then updated the core data cache, and then that updated everything on the screen. And it th- I think it's theoretically possible to do. Uh, and there, there's like one video I found by Donnie Walls, who actually he did it. He did um, a blog post about this a while ago, but then he did this nice presentation with uh, Coca Heads NL, I think. Where, I don't oh, know. Uh, New Zealand, or I don't know what what's NL. <laughs> we look terrible we're americans we don't know anything about geography geography uh, bad <laughs> no but i'll, I'll put a but link I in here i dare you i dare you any of you who are outside of philadelphia i dare you to guess where philadelphia is and i'm sure you you wouldn't know <laughs> yeah um but anyway he he did a great video about property wrappers where he uh he builds a property wrapper that does an api call mm-hmm and uh, I was like, and he even mentions in passing, I was like, you know, you can do things with core data, whatever in there, because it, the property wrapper metaphor is really useful. So maybe what I just want is uh, like a, I, I want a way of better integrating data from outside with data from core data without having to duplicate things. Mm-hmm. Like that's really what yeah. I guess it comes down to. I don't want to have to, like if my model is a core data model, I want to just convert right into it. But then I don't want to be limited by the core data type restrictions sometimes i guess it's kind of interesting I, a much better abstraction at the very least of, yeah it, it's, of... it's not that it's bad it's just that it's just and they've done so much work to make it fit better i think people really maybe don't realize sometimes oh yeah it was a lot worse <laughs> but it's like it, it it it's reaching i feel like it's reaching the limits of what you can adapt an objective c uh, assuming framework for mm-hmm. Swift to work yeah. like. like I, I think people really want to be able to be like, here's my struct. I mean, here's my here's my like enum, my Swift enum. I want this to be able to go in to in there too. Like you want to be able to model things so that they map into all the Swift native data structures. Right now you can't do that. Mm-hmm. Like you have yeah. to do workarounds for certain data types if you want to map them into core data. And that's what I think w- is what people want when they say they want like a new 
uh, new new soda. At least that's what I think I want right now, based on my my current I, level I, experience with it. I I am I'm a hundred percent with you there. Yeah. So we we'll talk about that on a future one. We'll we'll yep. we'll, we'll do all this, and maybe I'll I'll have some more property rapper stuff to talk about because I really think this. I, look, property rappers are limited, but they're cool, and yep. I do feel like that's Apple saying this is how you should integrate the between like the view and your model like this is the integration point and it sure. makes it makes sure if you do it if you if you can use it it makes it very clean very clean looking like like all the apple examples are mm-hmm. even so and it allows you to really um isolate a lot of uh, code in one place I, I feel like this is a fun possible talk steve yeah. uh yeah that's I'm, I'm working i'm gonna try to build some stuff and see if i can get it to work and then i'll do a talk or something about it very cool uh, very if i get cool. it working so well I think we should wrap this up. Yeah, we're today. like twenty minutes over. It's gonna be like a, uh, it's gonna this is gonna be so long. It's I'm gonna be like this is like a Darren Fireball talk at this point. I know. Like what? Are, yeah. Who do we think we are? We're not Gruber. <laughs> yeah, any any uh, any last words, uh, Aaron? <laughs> no, we already went way over, so I won't make Steve job. Steve's no, no, job it's harder. okay. Don't worry about my. No, 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 wait, mostly, wait, 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 wait. You mostly, got something to say? Just, you got a hot take. Yeah, yeah. Thing. Don't you, no. you take, give us give us your take. Uh, don't worry about my editing job. That's like future C's from. No, I'm, I'm good. Well. We can talk about the the core data stuff later. Well, yeah, right. I think the core data stuff will yeah, be yeah. better to talk about later. But yeah. uh, I just, I, I just, it's just been on my mind because I've been doing a lot of uh, research. Cool. Uh, so well. good. I think I think that was a that was a, a very long and I hopefully entertaining episode. <laughs> yes. Uh, for everybody. Well, cool. Well, that's all we have for today. You can learn more about Philly Coco at phillycoco.org. There you'll find links to our Slack group, meetup schedule, and contact info. If you're feeling generous. Please leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or whatever your podcast platform of choice is. And share us with all your developer friends. And one more thing. A foo walks into a bar, takes a look around, and then says, Hello, world. (laughs) My God. What? (laughs) I'm not even trying to understand that joke. A foo walks into a bar. I get the foo bar thing, and he says, Hello, world. I'm like, it's not like mixing two different. It's a programmer cons- joke. Work with me here. It's it's good. I like it. All right. Uh, why did a why did the programmer die in the shower? He read know. the soap bottle instructions: lather, rinse, repeat. Oh my god! He got an infinite loop. <laughs> so he's just gonna that's, stuck. Yes. Yes. He'll run out of he'll run out of shampoo at some point. At some point. Oh, that's a good point. See, there's a bug in that See, that whole bug. joke. <laughs> the bug in the joke, right? <laughs> and then the last one. <laughs> what is the most used language in programming? What? Profanity. Oh, <laughs> so very true. So very true. It's a good thing that I work from home. <laughs> exactly. Till next time. Good luck on your own developer journey. We will cheer for you always. Cheer up!